Hello, everyone. It's Takuya here. And I'm Gabby. And welcome back to the podcast, my host. First things first, if you guys have any family histories or family stories that you would like to send into the podcast for our family history segment, please go ahead and do that because, you know, we don't want to run out. Of course. And also, we just got the latest booking for our Italy trip, which means that there are only five spots left for the trip that is going to be leaving in May. So if you want to join us, then by all means, make sure to click the links in the description because there's, again, only a few spots left. Also, if you guys are looking for extra podcast episodes, we are up to French Revolution Part 6 with French Revolution Part 7 publishing next week. There's so, so many. Make sure to check out Patreon because this has been ongoing. Yes, it has. It's been a whole process. But speaking of a process, which, you know, sometimes those end in disaster. Um, this is a horrible segue that I'm trying to do this right now. Anyway, <laughs> this week's episode is on submarine disasters. So on my podcast, <laughs> Mystery of Everything, We've been doing a series on deep water disasters. So I did one on oil rig disasters and then a more recent one on saturation diving incidents. And then I was working on my submarine disasters episode when he stole my idea and started writing about okay, it. Listen, it was an accident. All right. When I got inspired by her writing the whole thing for the deep water disaster, I was like, man, that sounds awesome. I should do some deep water disasters and stuff. What, what kind of disasters? Let's see, you got ships. Okay. But a ship disaster. Maybe there's not as many records. Ooh, what about submarines? And so I started doing submarines and then I go and say, Gabby, look, check it out. I took inspiration from you. I'm doing this thing. And I list off one of the things that I was going to cover. And the look of I was you already bastard. writing my episode and he started writing it. So now this is going to be a two part episode with the first part of submarine disasters being on the history of everything. And the second part, you can tune in next week on mystery of everything to listen to. <laughs> Exactly. So it's, let's get into it. So initially, what I was going to end up doing was I was going to do like a top four, five, six, like, which is basically a list of varying different disasters. But then I realized since we were going to be doing this with, you know, part one, part two kind of thing here, I wanted to cover two of the most interesting ones, in my opinion, or at least ones that were kind of related. Because I'm going to ask you this just off the top of your head. If you think of reckless technology that leads to sacrifice of human lives, uh, are there any countries in particular that pop up? China. China. Okay, you know, that's like, actually, that's a really good example here. Russia. Russia. There, that's the one that I was shooting for, but that was a very good answer that you'd probably say for that. Yeah. Yeah, both, both definitely United States. Apply. You can list any country and then make an argument for it. It really doesn't matter. You could. Te yeah, technically speaking, you could. I need to cover a whole thing on the, on the nukes where they would, um, they wanted to use like nukes for peace to like use nuclear bombs for infrastructure projects. Like, we're going to dig a canal. How are we going to dig? Well, we could just have a team of 1,000 people working with shovels. We could have a team of 50 people with excavators. Or we could just drop a couple nukes. That idea did not work. I'm telling you all right now, do not advocate for it. That was a terrible, terrible idea. They didn't really understand contamination, what would happen with waterways. Anyway. But submarines. Yes. <laughs> Speaking of nuclear, nuclear submarines, which is the thing that I wanted to get into. So there are two that we are going to be talking about today. Both are Russia. And that's why I started that little segue here from the beginning with talking about a country that you think of not actually handling things properly. So the first one that we're going to be talking about is actually the more recent of the two. And it's going to go back further. The K-152 INS Chakra, which that one actually, its original name was not the Chakra. That's what it got after. That's the name that it got after it went to India. Its initial name was the Nerpa, which I love that name. I love to say that. It's just, oh, it is the deadliest attack craft of all. What is it? The Nerpa. I'm sorry. I but just, what happened with it? Okay. okay. <laughs> Please, the podcast is called Submarine Disaster. I know, I know. Okay. We're covering that, right? But hey, my friends, before we get back to the podcast episode, I would just like to thank each and every one of you for listening. And I would also like to thank the sponsor for today's video slash podcast from this Rocket Money, which my friends, for those of you who don't know what Rocket Money is, please allow me to explain. And I don't need any kind of fancy graphics or anything behind me or a skip button that you can't actually skip here in the bottom, which, yeah, I saw the last time I did this, how annoyed a bunch of you were. Hear me out on this. Rocket Money is a service that will allow you to cancel subscriptions. It will lower your bills. It will track your spending all in one place. And it is a fantastically easy thing to use. It is something that my family personally 
Family uses. I have used it for the last two years. And thanks to that, we've been able to catch a lot of different subscriptions that I, unfortunately, due to the fact that I have a child that I sign up subscriptions for, for varying different like children's show programs or whatever here for her iPad, um, we then subsequently forget about, which ends up costing us a lot of money. But luckily, Rocket Money has saved us quite a number of times on that. It is a super easy service that I promise you is something that can actually help. And I'm not saying this by virtue of an ad. I'm saying this by virtue of, no, this is a genuine thing that I use and love. So if you want to both support my channel and simultaneously get something that can really help you in your life, then please, my friends, go to rocketmoney.com slash ho. That is rocketmoney.com slash H-O-E, rocketmoney.com slash ho. Thank you, my friends, and enjoy the podcast. So the NERPA is a ship. It was a submarine that was laid down at the, and forgive me when I say this, I'm going to have to look at the notes repeatedly from all the Russian names that I have listed onto this. It's a bit of a process. The Kom- Komsomolonsk on Amur shipyard. Basically, it's one of the big shipyards that they would have in 1993. But the problem with when they first initially laid down this submarine in order to complete it uh, is that it got very heavily delayed. And if you're wondering, well, why would that happen? Why would you end up getting, you know, to the delay a ship? Was there monetary problems? Was there staff problems? Monetary was there, problems. There was everything. Everything was a problem. Do you know what, the, what was happening in the 90s in Russia? All of the Soviet Union? Yep. <laughs> Which means that all the extra income, all the extra everything that was going on at this time, gone. There was really no way to do anything. So this ship was set to be constructed over the course of the 90s, but it, because of the economic crisis that Russia ended up experiencing in the early 1990s, nothing really happened. And so this partly constructed vessel, because mind you, they were working on it. The entire time that they were doing this, it just stopped for large periods of time. It was effectively mothballed until 2004. So this thing started in 1993, and then 11 years later, this partially constructed shell, only then did they start to actually pick it up again. And this was when Rosprom, which is the federal agency for industry inside of Russia, signed an agreement with the Indian government that they would go and complete the submarine And upon completion, afterwards, it would be leased to the Indian Navy for a set amount of time. The vessel was then intended to be completed by 2007. But um, listen, every time there's a big project to construct anything, you can guarantee two things, typically. One, it's going to cost way more than you anticipated that it would in the first place. That's mega projects in general, which I'm going to cover a lot of, especially on YouTube here. And the second thing is that it's going to take a lot longer than you estimated in the first place. Off topic, but your hair is sticking up in every single direction. Yes, I'm going to say that it is because I specifically tried to wet my hair this morning and then went into a freezing garage, where instead of wetting down my hair, it proceeded to stiffen. Right. Which, yeah, that's, that's what we're going to go with on that. Um, so, okay, in 2007, it gets transported to the Volstok shipyard in the closed city of Bolshe Kamen. And this is in Primorsky Krai for fitting out, like in order to be prepared to actually launch. It was then launched in October of 2008 for sea trials, following which it was then due to be handed over to the Russian Defense Ministry. And reports in Indian media would suggest that the resumption of construction was specifically underwritten by Indian funding. So they funded the completion of the craft because Russia didn't have the money to complete it. Yes. And also, this was in the 2000s. They didn't have the money to complete it in the 2000s. Oh my God, no. That's the thing. We're going to get into this. There's a whole segment that is going into this. Um, I, I can't remember where. I know I put it in the notes, but there is a segment of where the Russian Navy member, like personnel were deployed that they just straight up did not receive any pay for like six months. Like That happens They sometimes. literally just didn't receive anything. Government shutdowns, loss of pay information. It happens yeah. to the best of us. And everything with the fall of the Soviet Union kind of went to shit. And I know at some point we're probably going to end up having to cover an episode on doing that because it's, I mean, it's good for a podcast probably. That's just, that's just suitable. Anyway, the standards of the vessel's construction were already being criticized by a number of people because when you have all these delays, you have this evolving technology and with the fact that it was being constructed at the end of the Soviet Union era period or beginning of Russia, where Russia was significantly further behind in the West, it just, um, it's, there were some problems with it. Also, they weren't paying the people who were constructing it. Yeah, yeah, there was a You're decent number of people. You're moving that mic a lot, it will cut out. 
Oh. It's probably already cut out. So, okay. One of the people that we're talking about here is Alexander Goltz, the defense editor of the Yitzveni Zernal newspaper, who had said in the 1980s that, quote, the immersed shipyard turned out submarines one after the other like pancakes. So, because, you know, it's the Soviet Union, they're constructing things rapidly. They are producing a lot of different things. But from 1993 to 2008, they had produced how many? Just one. Just one. But that's not their fault. They had no funding. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, they didn't have funding. They didn't have personnel. They didn't have anything. So what he would say is that the old personnel, like the specialists had left, and that the new ones who took their place, they didn't have any real professionalism or ability. So they didn't have the experience to take over. They just had to take over because there was no one else to do it. Correct. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly how it worked. And so there was an unnamed worker at the Amur shipyard that told the Komsolotskaya Pravada that there were questions about the quality of the metal that was used in the building of the nuclear submarine that, quote, some of it had been bought from China. Now, for a lot of people, they're probably thinking, OK, well, yeah, there's a lot of memes and talks about Chinese construction and exactly what that is that it could mean. Don't they buy a lot of scrap metals? Oh, my to God. Reuse, yes. To yeah. recycle. Yep. Yep. I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but then I guess depending on what quality you need. Exactly. And when you're talking about the construction of a nuclear submarine, something that requires very strong materials, because you cannot risk that there's any kind of real structural weakness in this thing. Yeah. If there's like a breach in the hull, it'll go full Titan submersible, essentially. Ugh. If it's at a depth, you know, that would cause explosive decompression. But. Yeah, so you do not want that at all. And the problem with Chinese quality steel is that it's typically um, very, very, very low quality. That's, that's typically the major problem that happens with that. I'm doing a whole episode on tofu dregs if that hasn't released by the time that any of this actually goes out. It depends. So here, here, here's the thing. When the first trials of the submarine were being carried out, water was leaking into it between the seams. It happens, you know. I mean, not with submarines, but it happens. So the worker would say, and I quote, it's not surprising that work on the submarine dragged on. Did India still buy it? Yes. Darn. Yes. But uh, there's going to be a number of things that end up happening in this. Remember, we're talking about disasters, which means that something is still going to happen, right? And that brings us to the accident. So at the time of the accident, the NERPA was undergoing sea trials at the Russian Pacific Fleet's test range in Peter the Great Gulf, which is an inlet of the Sea of Japan that is adjoining to the coast of Russia's Primorsky Krai province. And the vessel had at this point not yet been accepted by the Russian Navy, but it was undergoing its varying different plant tests under the supervision of a team from the Amursky shipbuilding plant. And so for this reason, instead of just the standard military personnel that would normally be on it, it had a much larger group of people including a lot of civilian contractors and people. You had civilian engineers that were responsible for building and outfitting the submarine that were on it and a whole host of others. So the accident then, of what would happen, would occur at 8.30 p.m. local time on the 8th of November, 2008, during the submarine's first underwater test run. So they were working on it. They knew it was leaking. They knew it wasn't Probably yes. the best construction. And yes. they still were like, let's get on this ship. Yes to all of what you just said. Yes. So one interesting thing that I've noticed while covering deep sea disasters and deep ocean disasters, which does not apply to this because we use submarines since like World War II, like nuclear submarines. Yeah. So they have had so much experience to get the kinks worked out of nuclear submarines. And that's how this episode really differs from a lot of the deep sea disasters, because a lot of the disasters that I covered with oil rigs, with saturation diving, they were, they happened when we were working out the kinks, essentially, like they were learning what safety protocols should be in place. And yeah, some were due to gross negligence, such as, you know. But a lot of it could be due to experience because they literally didn't know. But a lot of it was the disaster, unfortunately, had to happen so that the proper precautions could be put in place and the proper protocols could be put in place. And unfortunately, a lot of the times the corporations have to get called out like, hey, why? And then, you know, actual things implemented to make sure they don't occur. But they already had all of the experience with nuclear submarines since like the 40s. Yes. Well, there's I mean, no reason. Actually, for what it. was the first well, maybe nuclear not Russia submarine. specifically, but I know they had a lot of submarines. I'm pretty sure the first nu- nuclear submarine was in the 
lefties, if I oh, recall yeah, correctly. Oh, yeah, but I'm saying like U-boats. I know there were in some, you know, but. Yeah, but they still had the experience. That's still a good 40, no, actually 50 years of experience. It was over a the lot of time to work out the kinks and put in safety protocols oh, and yeah. the what to do and what not to do. Yeah. Well, what happened here in this case is really dumb. The submarine's fire extinguishing system was triggered and it ended up sealing two forward compartments and filling them with Freon R114B2 gas, which it has the scientific name that I wrote in here. And I'm going to try to pronounce it. So please, for the love of God, don't make fun of me all that much. Hydrobomofluorocarbon. Well, yeah, well, yes, that's what it was. That was the type. But I'm talking about the dibromotrofluoranane. Dibromotetrafluoroethane. That thing. Also known as Caledon. Dibromo. If. If you just, if you take apart that name, it tells you exactly what you would need to draw to draw the chemical structure. Yeah. Like, dye, there's two, bromo, tetra, that's four, mm-hmm. fluoroethane. Yes. So. I do understand that. You just that. take the word apart. You don't just, just try to say the entire word. Listen, when you say it, all right, the, the scientific name is clearly, it's just German. You just say one massive string of letters and then it just works out. I mean, yeah, you could do that. (laughs) You could do that. Why not? Why not? So the gas, as you were talking about it being a hybromofluorocarbon, right? Like hydrobromofluorocarbon. (laughs) Okay. With it being (laughs) this thing, which was a refrigerant, right? Mind you, this was something that was used in the Russian Navy's LOK fire system or the LOKH. And what the idea of this thing was is that each compartment of the Russian submarine contained an LOKH station, which Freon could then be delivered from that into adjacent compartments. And what Freon does is it goes and it displaces oxygen, which enables it to extinguish fires rapidly. That that is something that would be very helpful, particularly in an enclosed space so the fire doesn't just eat everything up. The problem is, is that in high concentrations of this in the air, uh, it can cause narcosis, which progresses by stages into being really excited, excitation, mental confusion, lethargy, and then ultimately asphyxiating to death. That's not great. It's not ideal. No, it's not. And so when this accident occurs, 20 people would go and die of asphyxiation. The number of injured people was put at 21, but this was then later revised to be 41 by the Amersky Shipbuilding Company which had a number of varying employees that were among the injured. And many of the injured were reported from suffering from frostbite that was caused by the chilling effect of the gas. Question. Um, Did they continue trying to build the ship after all of this? Yes. Oh, they they just call it a day. They were like, this is leaking. Both. It's been on delay for like 10 plus years. We really just killed like 20 something people. We don't need. Was it 20 something people? 21. Yeah, 21 people. Well, injured initially was 21. Anyway, a bunch of people got injured. We should just call it a quits. Give up. Scrap the whole project. So, okay, obviously, a whole bunch of people have asphyxiated. It is not a good situation at all. And following the incident, the Udaloy class destroyer Admiral Trivets and the rescue vessel, the Sane, were then dispatched from Vladivostok to provide assistance to the stricken submarine. Um, They couldn't really do anything there. The injured survivors then had to be transferred to the destroyer and be sent to military hospitals for treatment. While the submarine would then return under its own power, so it didn't have to be towed or anything, to Primorsky Krai. And according to a naval spokesman by the name of Igor Degailo, the vessel was not damaged in the incident and radiation levels remained normal. Okay, so they can keep using it because radiation levels remain normal. Yes, really it was a gas incident that occurred inside of it. So then a lot of people are going to wonder, okay, well, how the hell does that even happen in the first place? What happened? It's like there was no explosion. People still died. It was gas. And there was no kind of radioactive leak that occurred from this. Because, I mean, it's a nuclear submarine. So if anything happens and that goes nuclear, so to speak, you're talking about a major disaster. Well, there are multiple explanations, but there are two big ones. And at this point, these are theories. I'm not going to tell you definitively that this is exactly what happened. These are the two primary theories about what went down, and it is still pretty contentious within Russia as to what exactly happened. Sometimes with these disasters, because 
things sometimes, you know, get damaged or cover up. So we're recorded properly. It's really hard to figure out exactly what went down. Correct. We arguably have more information that comes from stuff like this from a vessel that ends up surviving because some of these, they went boom. Oh, yeah. And that you can't really do much after that. So the two principal explanations of the disaster have been advanced by naval experts in the media that there was either a failure of the equipment or that there was a failure of the human variety. We, they That's literally, okay, I just did the Bifford dolphin incident and a few others, and they were like, we can't definitively tell you what went wrong. We know it went wrong, but we don't know how. So it might have been human error and also machinery. That, that is literally just the So you standard. mean the only things that are available that could possibly happen that it yeah. was either a human or a machine? That's just the standard of we just can't pinpoint it. We're so sorry. Mm -hmm. I guess technically speaking, there is a third option where they say like the like an act of God, if it was weather or something else really just happened. True. Yeah. Technically, there is that. But that was that was not what happened in here. So remember how we were talking about that fire suppression system? L-O-K-H. Yes, L -O -K. The, yes, the L-O-K-H. So this system aboard the NERPA was reportedly a new type of system, something that had not previously been used on any other Russian submarine. It was brand new. So they were working out the kinks. Though. They were working out the kinks, yes. Okay, so, I mean, understandably, they would continue to use the sub once they worked out the kinks to yes. the suppression system. And so, you know how when people talk about stuff for the future, they're always talking about advancements, the next big thing, next big technology, the next, next big everything, especially automation. Yeah. That's the big difference that happened here with the LOKH. See, the old system that they used was still an LOKH system, but it wasn't automatic. It was a manual system. And so, in order to be able to operate it, you had to manually control it from the duty shift console. That's what you had to do. But the new system that was put on the NERPA could also operate in automatic mode that could respond to any kind of smoke or a sudden and drastic rise in compartment temperature. Like if it senses, hey, it went from 65 degrees to 150 degrees inside the compartment, that likely means that there is a fire. So it's going to activate. That's really interesting because that's, you know, certain with certain gases, when you pump them into compartments, like based on where you are underwater, it can also change the temperature. So that was, oh yeah, I guess that was it interesting. Could. I guess it could. And in this case, it was supposed to just mitigate whatever would have been potentially in there. And so according to the testimony of an engineer from the Zazeda shipyard, this apparently malfunctioned before while the submarine was being readied for sea trials. So they already knew, okay, it had malfunctioned before they even left to go out to sea anyway. But they wouldn't know why, so they wouldn't be able to troubleshoot it. So if it's already outfitted, what were they supposed <laughs> to do, remove it? And so some commenters <laughs> I speculated that. that potentially it was simply misreading something, like cigarette smoke or some other thing that was in the, in the compartment that triggered it, and then boom, it deployed. And that was the issue. That is a reasonable explanation of something that could happen, but they still don't have an idea of why it would. Like they, they theorize that, oh, maybe it was triggered by cigarette smoke. Then who was smoking the cigarette? Where did that come from? Who was doing what? We don't know. The other option is human error. And this one, oh God, this, 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 sounds, this sounds so incredibly stupid. So on the 10th of November, the Russian Navy would issue a statement that would blame the disaster on a, quote, unsanctioned operation of the fire suppression system aboard the NERPA. And three days later, naval investigators would announce that a specific crewman by the name of, though this was unofficial at the time, Dmitry Gorbov had turned on the system without permission on any particular grounds. So he wasn't, allowed, he wasn't supposed to put it on. Yeah. Not only that, but the on with or without particular grounds or on no particular grounds means that there was literally no reason to do it. He just did it as though like fiddling around with it or messing around with it. Is this true or are they covering it up? Yeah, see, we, we don't know. So the statement of what it is that they would say is that out of boredom, he had started playing with the system. I could see that happening. I could see that happening, unfortunately. And the submarine local control units are protected by a five-digit access number. But here's the kicker. And this is where there possibly is a reason why something like this could have happened. It is supposed to be protected by this five-digit access code. But during C trials, the access codes were penciled in. Like they literally had like a, like a sticky note. Like there'd be a note 
literally right next to the console that would have all the digits that you had to actually input. And they had it there because they needed it for the C trial. Believe it or not, that's not the craziest thing I heard. And one of the disasters I covered on my podcast this week, they redid the dive bell. Essentially, that's uh-huh. what takes the divers down to the ocean floor. They redid how it would operate and how its safety features operated and the valves that you need to turn to like release. Yeah, they didn't update the user manual. Oh my God, what? So they were like trying to release the dive oh. weight, like the weight that holds the dive bell and it just caused the entire thing to shoot to the surface from the ocean floor. Oh. And also because they had the wrong valves open, the bottom was completely open. So while they're shooting up and explosively decompressing, they're also drowning. <laughs> so, I mean, oh. that's not the craziest thing I've ever heard. God. Wow. All right. Yep. That's, that's arguably yeah, worse than it's terrible. Yeah. Happens quite a bit, actually. So what Russia would say from this is that this particular sailor increased the readings from the original value of 30 degrees Celsius to 78 degrees Celsius, just literally fiddling around with the dial and everything and messing around with it. Oh. Which, you remember the whole sudden increase in temperature thing? Yeah. So this would have caused the control system to believe that there was a fire on board, and the control system requested permission to start the fire suppression system, and Grubov reportedly granted permission, possibly without understanding exactly what it is that he was even doing in the first place. Not good. He was charged and would face up to seven years in prison if convicted, but his colleagues, like the other sailors that actually managed to survive this, um, they expressed skepticism. They didn't think that he had done this, describing him as a very experienced, very skilled specialist that he wouldn't do something like that. I don't like conspiracies, but I feel like that was just a cop out, like a cover up. They were like, we can't have this happening because we just sold the submarine, essentially leased it to India. Also, the brand new state of the art suppression system that they just developed, having some massive kinks in it that caused the deaths of a whole bunch of people. No, 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 no. It clearly wasn't this thing that we spent potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars constructing. But do we know if we still use that fire support? Like if they still use, does anyone still use it? For the LOKH? Actually, I'm not sure what goes into recent. the modern Russia thing. There have been developments within it, but I don't know if it utilizes the same Freon-based thing. I don't know. And oh, with the, Freon, yeah. Yeah, and with the updated tech, possibly something related. But also, I don't think Russia has the same limitations on Freon that the United States does. I'll look it up. That's actually a very good point. I don't know if they have because for like, you know, a lot of the stuff that we would utilize, that was very, very common here over the course of like the 1900s, like the the late 1900s here in the US. And all that has pretty much been phased out, at least gradually. There are some things that really don't. And so a lot of commentators and his colleagues and other people would say, hey, he probably didn't do this thing. We think that he is just being used as a scapegoat. We don't know though. We literally do not know. And so a number of retired naval officers would t- like tell the business daily Kormersant that they doubted that Grobov was solely to blame as it was impossible, and this is what they would say, impossible for one person to activate the system due to it requiring multiple levels of confirmation before it can be activated. So that statement that Russia put out about, oh, well, when it asked him for permission, he just said yes. Well, according to the others, they were saying, that shouldn't have happened because even if he approved it, it should have also required other input to be able to l- activate it. They don't know. Oh, did you find the thing? Oh, no, I haven't found it yet. You haven't found the thing? Yeah, so I, I, either way, I don't know. And that's the thing. They don't know either. They don't know what happened because even the human error explanation, other people, other specialists were saying, no, it doesn't require one person to approve of this to happen. It takes multiple people. So. In the end, we don't really know. And according to the survivors, those that have been affected by the gas were completely caught off guard and they may not have been awarded or like uh, they may not have been alerted in time due to warning sirens sounding only after the gas had already begun to pour in. So when the system was activating and kicking on, there was no warning. It just did it. And only afterwards, when it was sensed, then did the warning lights come on in the first place. Yeah. So some of the victims were reported to have been unable to don breathing kits before they suffocated. One of them, Igor Kurdin, a former Typhoon class submarine commander and who is actually the current head of the St. Petersburg Submariners Club, attributed the high casualty count to the presence of a large number of civilian specialists. 
because this was civilians. They weren't military personnel who had been drilled specifically to respond to the situation. So when everything went to shit, they weren't able to respond appropriately. They so. weren't prepared. And we know that they weren't able to prepare themselves properly. We know they weren't able to respond because of all the 20 deaths, 17 of them were civilians, which is a very high casualty rate for specifically that. And so what he would note is that the civilian observers would be untrained in proper response to the release of the boat's firefighting gas, which would have been preceded with specific lights and sound signals and everything that the military would have understood. After, after which, on board, everyone is supposed to put on oxygen masks, which would then allow them to survive during the 30-minute period that it would take to actually ventilate the gas back out so they could take care of it. And in addition, because the accident occurred at 8.30 p.m., and remember when anyone was on a submarine or doing anything of these in shifts, especially for like the 8 to 12-hour shifts, they are operating between who is asleep and who is working. At 8.30 p.m., a bunch of people would have already been asleep, meaning that they would not have seen any lights. They wouldn't have seen anything happening. They would have just begun to suffocate in their sleep and I then mean, die. At least they probably weren't aware. And so this incident would end up being the worst disaster that Russia had faced since 2000, which is the event that I accidentally stole from you in the first place, what I meant to talk about this in the first place, the disaster of Kursk. <laughs> we really need to start checking in with each other before we write. Yeah. But okay, that was pretty bad, but at least there were survivors. Oh, there were. And also they had the submarine itself to look at. When I did oil rigs, um, these were in the ocean. Yes. They got completely wiped out by storms or fires, explosions. Because it was the North Sea, right? North Sea. And it was, it was spread out. A lot of okay. this happened in the North Sea as well. But the ones that were completely wiped out by fires and storms, I mean, they sank. You couldn't really figure out what went wrong because there was nothing left to examine. And then in a bunch of them, one of them that I did, there were absolutely no survivors. And there was one lifeboat that had survivors and it, got, it actually got latched on. You guys have to go listen to this oil rigs episode. They caught it. Like they, the rescue ship actually got the lifeboat uh -huh. but, and they fastened it to their ship. But then a big wave just came and like killed everyone on the like lifeboat, the rescue boat. So oh. absolutely nobody survived. It was really brutal. Like those were so sad because it was just either everybody died or just a few people lived. Um, overall, not great. And then when I was doing the saturation diving episode as well, I mean, in a lot of it, everybody died. There was one, though, where everybody lived. And there Yay! were some where, like, one person lived. But um, overall, not great odds. Go figure. You know, when you name something a disaster, um, it's an actual disaster. I know, but some people survived this one. So I'm calling it more positive than some other disasters. No, that's true. That could have happened. Because the other thing is what the oil rigs that would sink and stuff like that, you can't even recover the bodies. No, especially not on something that is as violent as the North Sea. Because some of them actually got damaged in storms. And so, you know, they can get who shows up, but then... Were any bodies... I, cause I have to ask this because I actually haven't even listened to it. Were the, um, were the bodies washing up on shore? I don't know. I didn't look into that. I just looked into how many people made it, how many people didn't make it Ugh. type vibes. Because if it's the North Sea, the water is going to be very cold, which means that it's likely going a to... A lot of people did die from hypothermia in one because they couldn't Ugh. get lifeboats to deploy. Honestly, guys, you, have, you should listen to this episode. You would actually think it's fascinatingly disturbing. Yup. <laughs> so, okay. The big one then, the major disaster, the one where it's not so happy of an ending like in the one that we talked about here before. Which That was a happy ending. When 20 people out of like 200 something, okay, fine. Well, not even 200, what would it be? Like, no, it was 127. Yeah. When it's like those ratio, um, that's, that's not nearly as bad. Fine. But Kursk though, oh boy. So the Kursk, the K141 Kursk, this was an Oscar II class nuclear powered cruise missile submarine of the Russian Navy. And it is something that is named after the Russian city of Kursk, you know, this one of the things they would go after, which ironically enough, and I, I think this would make a great podcast episode from this. Uh, the Kursk, like the name of where the, the, the reason why this is so famous and why a whole bunch of people that are listening to this might recognize that in the first place is that if you know World War II history, the Battle of Kursk was the largest tank battle in military history. I don't know World War II history. 
but I'm married to someone who does. So that's why I know that. Gabby, the Battle of Kursk was the largest tank battle in military history. <laughs> Just so you know. And it took place back in 1943. And oh my God, was that thing a doozy? I've heard. <laughs> that's, that's one way to describe it. Oh boy, was that a doozy. <laughs> So this was one of the first vessels that was completed after the end of the Soviet Union, and it was commissioned into the Russian Navy's northern fleet. The story of it, though, is kind of interesting, because when building on Kursk began back in like 19, uh, back, like back in 1990 at Zverodvinsk, which is near Argenelsk, which is that's the, um, God, how do I even describe it? It's the Arctic base, basically, of Russia. You know how Russia has all those little... Um, Okay, it's going to sound like a dumb way to describe this. Sonic the Hedgehog looking spike bit peninsulas, essentially, that go out of the north of it, right? That jut out into the Arctic. Ah, yes. I'm familiar with the Sonic the Hedgehog <laughs> spike <laughs> bit peninsula. I don't know how to describe it here. It's basically one of those Arctic bases. It's one of the things that would lead into the, like, into the North, not North Sea. Would that, would that be the North Sea? It, it leads to the Arctic. It's the place that is frozen for, like, 90% of its time here, basically. it's. It's cold. So when this was launched in 1994, it was commissioned in December of that year, and it was the penultimate or second to last Oscar II class submarine that was designed and approved in the Soviet era. And this thing, oh my God, was this a monster. There's a thing about the Soviets, and we talk about the differences in submarines and how they, um, how they develop things. A key component of difference between Soviet submarine technology and American Tech, like submarine technology was that America and the Soviet Union were initially in a kind of, um, God, how do I even phrase this? A giant dick measuring contest in both uh, nuclear submarines and nukes in general. So it was always the solution of bigger is better, right? The Cold War, you want the bigger bomb. It's you not want the about the size of the bomb. It's about how you use it. Yes, literally. And that actually is what applies to the military tech. Because the problem was, is that initially they were in a, a, a contest to build the biggest and best one. But then it was realized as time went on and technology got better, um, you don't need to have something be bigger. You just need it to be more effective. You just need to make a bigger boom. Like if it leaves a bigger impact, you don't need to worry about the size of it. Right, guys? Just keep that in mind. You just want to make sure that when it goes <laughs> off... It really is impactful, life-changing, earth-shattering. Am I really capturing this? Yes, you, you are free? capturing it perfectly, my dear. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. for your Yes, beautiful. Beautiful. And so when this thing was built, right? The Soviets had still maintained the policy of bigger is better, literally going all the way to the end of the fall of the Soviet Union. Meanwhile, American vessels got smaller and more efficient, but the Soviets uh, were the not Americans really Americans were smaller and more efficient. Yes. I mean, efficiency is fine, but were they leaving that big of an impact that we just talked about? Like the mind-blowing impact. Trust me, there's going to be a lot of mind-blowing impacts that are going to be occurring over the course of this thing that we're talking Do about. Do people die? A lot of people die. Damn, okay. Yeah. That's sad. So th here's the thing about the Oscar II and what ends up happening. This was the biggest, or like one of the biggest attack submarines. I actually think for when I put this in there, it was the biggest attack submarine that had ever been built up to this point. At 154 meters or 505 feet long and four stories high. Four story submarine. Four story submarine. It was the largest attack submarine ever built. Yeah. Yeah, they, were, they just won the submarine dick measuring contest. Yep. yep. Can I say dick? Yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, I know we can say it here on the podcast and maybe James will go and provide a beep in here when he's editing this thing together. We put this, but uh, the outer hull here of this thing was made out of high nickel, high chrome content, stainless steel at 8.5 millimeters or 0.33 inches thick. And it had exceptionally good resistance to corrosion as well as a weak magnetic signature, which would help prevent detection by magnetic anomaly detectors or MAD systems. There was a two meter or a six foot seven inch gap in the 50.8 millimeter thick steel pressure hull. So you know how like there's like an outer hull and the inner hull. So there's like yeah. a gap between it, which aids with it. So this thing was designed to go deep. Oh God, I shouldn't be saying anything like that. I just, this is a really hard episode for me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm trying. Okay. There's only certain ways that I can phrase because things here. Because people say about. I joke too much in reviews. So I'm like really trying to be so serious, you know? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. 
Yes, I know. A okay. difficult time. So the Kursk was part of Russia's northern fleet, which had suffered severe funding cutbacks through over the course of the 1990s, as we already talked about. So many of its submarines were anchored and rusting, like they literally were not being used at all at the uh, Zapotnaya Litsa naval base, which was 100 kilometers from Murmansk. Very little work was done during this time in order to actually maintain any of their vessels, except for the most essential things that had to be used, like the most frontline equipment, including, you know, like search and rescue equipment. Because when you're literally piloting things in the Arctic, um, it's really hazardous, like with ice flows and everything. The ships would get lost every single year, getting stuck in ice, hitting something, etc. And so Russia employs a very large rescue fleet in order to be able to get these kinds of vessels. But Northern Fleet sailors had gone unpaid over the course of the mid-1990s. Like there were just large stretches of months or potentially even years where groups of sailors just straight up did not get paid at all. That doesn't sound good. Nope. And so the end of the decade would see basically a revival, a renaissance, if you will, in the fleet. In 1999, Kursk would carry out a successful reconnaissance mission in the Mediterranean, tracking the United States Sixth Fleet over the course of the Kosovo War, when everything in Yugoslavia was burning to the frickin' ground. Yeah, that was not a good situation. Um, Kursk would carry out a successful reconnaissance mission in the Mediterranean, tracking this during the Kosovo War, and in August of 2000, its training exercise was to have been the largest summer drill nine years after the Soviet Union's collapse, involving four attack submarines, something that hadn't been done since, well, the Soviet Union was a thing because they didn't really have the money before or after that in order to be able to spend on frivolous things like training your military. Wait, so does this get damaged in a training exercise? We're going to get into that. And not an actual battle. Yeah, we're going to get into that. Yeah. That means that we should do my submarine disasters one on U-boat incidents. Oh, oh, because like battles and other stuff? There were so many. Yes. Okay, that sounds like a lot of fun. I love that. So the flagship of the fleet was a vessel called the Piotr Veliki, which means like Peter the Great, and a flotilla of other smaller ships were supposed to be involved in this thing. On the morning of the 12th of August, 2000, as part of the naval exercise, Kursk was supposed to fire two dummy torpedoes at the Peter Veliki, or basically the the Peter the Great. Yes, I'm not even gonna try and say the Russian name for this. It tried to fire it at Peter the Great. And at 11.29 local time, a 6576 kit torpedo was then loaded into the Kursk number four torpedo tube. But because of a leaking weld in the torpedo's fuel system, high test peroxide, a form of highly concentrated hydrogen peroxide, which is used as an oxidizer for the torpedo's engine, escaped into the torpedo casing where it catalytically decomposed on the metals and oxides that were present there, yielding steam and oxygen. This is a bit of a problem. Because if you're going into an area that is already sealed, highly pressurized, and you release more gas into it that overpressurizes it, this caused the kerosene tank, the fuel tank, to rupture, which then caused an explosion that registered as a weak seismic signature on detectors hundreds of kilometers away. Wait, so what do they use as submarine fuel right now? Because they were using kerosene? No, 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 no. It's like um, it, th- th- this was for... Just for the thing that launched a torpedo. Yes, yes. Generally speaking, all the electrical systems, all the varying stuff that you see inside of nuclear or inside of submarines are nuclear. Okay, so That's, this is just a torpedo launching. Yes. There are still diesel submarines. Like as an example, I believe the largest fleet of diesel submarines in the world is owned by North Korea. North Korea actually has the most submarines in the world. Why aren't the torpedoes, why can't they be... I mean, this is probably like an obvious answer. That is. Why don't they just use the nuclear power? From how they launch, listen, I'm, I'm not going to- To I'm, launch the torpedoes. I'm not an engineer. I can't explain if to you precisely how it is that they do it. anybody listening knows the answer to this, let us know in the comments. I know you guys love to let us know yeah. in the comments. If you could explain in intricate detail exactly how a nuclear submarine fires a torpedo, I would greatly appreciate it. But also pretend like we're five and we don't understand big words. Because I can draw it, but um, when I draw it, that's going to involve stick figures. And I don't think that anyone in there is going to appreciate that. Yeah. So you, remember how I said this thing registered as like a seismic? <laughs> Wait, okay. How big was the blast though? Yeah. The blast was 100 to 250 kilograms or 220 to 550 pounds of TNT, which is not necessarily all that large when we talk about major explosions. But it is still something that when you are measuring its power, it registered as a 2.2 on the Richter scale. 
for earthquakes. So like a minor earthquake. Yeah. So like very minor. You hold on. What was the threshold where you don't feel anything? I don't know. I've been through quite a few of them. Can you look that up right now? At what is the Richter level or Richter scale level where you actually cannot feel an earthquake? I believe it was like four, right? Three and a half? Okay. So 2.5 to 5.4, they're often felt, but only cause minor damage. Okay. So if it was 2.2, that may not have even been felt. It was only by the systems that were actually tracking it that it would have been felt. Yeah. Okay. Oh, see, not that bad. So it might have registered, but no one would have actually like, you know, from far away, they wouldn't have felt it. That that makes a lot of sense. Okay. So the explosive reaction of 1.5 tons of concentrated hydrogen peroxide and 500 kilograms of kerosene then blew off the external torpedo tube cover and the internal tube door. It was bad. So it was four other submarines involved in this exercise? Yes, there was four other submarines that were, were involved. Were they okay? Or were they close submarines? to it? They were like a mixture of submarines and cruisers. Okay. Right? And they were supposed to fire it, but this all occurs within the one submarine, within the Kursk. Nothing has affected any of the other submarines at this point. Okay. Yeah. And so the issue was that the internal tube door, like when this all happens to it, this wasn't properly closed. The electrical connectors that existed between the torpedoes and the tube doors were generally unreliable because we're talking about Russian tech over the course of the 90s here. And oftentimes when they did this, it's like the equivalent of how do I put this? You know how when you are trying to plug in a USB or anything else like that and you're like, all right, I'm going to put it in. Doesn't work. Okay, flip it around to the other side. Plug it in. Nope, that's the wrong side. Flip it back in. And on the third time, magically, the way you initially tried in the first place, then it plugs in and works. Yeah. They basically had to do that continuously with trying to close torpedo doors. How important was the door, though? Um, No, I just feel like if it was important, it would have been easier to close. Yeah, much in the same way as when you try to, you know, create a a nice seal for a cannon that you're going to launch an explosive device out of. You probably need it to be properly sealed. So it's likely that at the moment of the explosion, the door was not fully closed. And so the blast would enter the front compartment, killing all seven men that were there. The bulkhead should have stopped the blast wave, but it ended up being penetrated by a light air conditioning channel, which allowed the passage of the blast wave. So theoretically, you know, it's like, okay, let's say an accident occurs there. It's supposed to have all this stuff around it that is supposed to mitigate the blast. They had checks, they had balances, they had stuff like... Safety measures but in place. similar to an exhaust uh, port on the Death Star, it allowed the wave of energy to go through the rest of the submarine. Fire and toxic smoke then blew into the second and perhaps the third, fourth, third and fourth components, which then injured or disoriented 36 of the men in the command post that was located in the second compartment and prevented the initiation of an emergency ballast tank blow in order to try and Resurface get to the, the surface. Submarine, exactly. Yeah. So, okay, all right, not good. Everything is bad. Potentially, though, they could get some help, right? Here's the problem. Were the search and rescue people not working? No, no, not that. The, um, an automatic emergency buoy, which is supposed to be deployed, designed to release on detection of conditions, like a fire, an explosion, rapid pressure changes, anything else, it didn't deploy. Why? It did, It just it didn't work. The previous summer in the Mediterranean mission, fears that the buoy might accidentally deploy and reveal a submarine's position to the U.S. meant that its automatic system had basically been turned off. It, they literally disabled their safety device so that if anything should happen to them, they were fresh out of luck. They would be found. I get it. They didn't want it to be like, you know, if they're spying, if they're doing some shady literally, shit. Literally, that's why. I understand that, but they weren't spying here. I know. They could have just like. Yep. Yep. So they had already turned it off and then. It doesn't matter. Like I'm just, I'm on, I'm reacting to the very but, thing that I'm putting so out here. So nobody knew what they did to have communi- like comms. Could they have been like, hey, we're fucked. Everything to is the other being ship. Disrupted. There were other ships. They were participating in a training exercise. Yep. Theoretically, they could have been like, hey, yo. <laughs> We're about to die. Here's the problem. As everyone is disoriented, there's toxic, toxic smoke. All of this is happening two minutes and 15 seconds after the initial eruption, a much larger explosion took place in the submarine and seismic data from stations across northern Europe would show that the explosion occurred at the same depth as the seabed, suggesting that the submarines, coll- like the submarine collided with the seafloor. 
Like this thing didn't just like slowly sink down afterwards. It plummeted in depth. And when you combine that with rising temperatures due to the initial explosion that had caused other torpedoes to explode, the second explosion, when you combine all of these things together, was the equivalent of two to three tons of TNT or five to seven torpedo warheads and measured a 4.2 on the Richter scale. Acoustic data from the Peter the Great indicated that the explosion of seven torpedo warheads was felt in rapid succession. That's not good. This was so bad that the second explosion ripped a two meter wide or 22 square foot hole in the hull of the craft, which was designed to withstand depths of a thousand meters or 3,300 square or 3,300 feet. It would rip open the third and fourth compartments and water would pour into these compartments at a rate of 90,000 liters or 3,200 cubic feet per second, killing all of those in the compartments instantaneously. The thing is, explosions underwater are worse. Yep. So on land, the same like explosion, the wave underwater is so much worse. Correct. So it makes sense that they just went. Yep. It was really bad. And so although rescue attempts were offered by the American, British and Norwegian teams, Russia initially declined help. I mean, that's embarrassing. I'd be like, nothing's wrong. Why are you offering me assistance? Yeah. I can figure it out. Thank you. It's a minor incident. So yeah. Stop being nosy. We're good. That would be me. I get it. You do not understand just how many times over the course of history when it comes to Russia. That was literally what happened with Russia time and time again. No, but the thing is, that would be so embarrassing. Like, okay, picture this. You're you're Russia. It's the 90s. Yes, it's the 90s. You were just the well, Soviet Union. Technically you were, it's 2000 now, but yes. Okay, you were cold warring it, okay? You were the big dog. You were up against the United States. You guys were like vibing. And then like, you know, you came out, you're like chilling. The Soviet Union freaking falls. Yes. Now you're trying to recover. Yes. It's embarrassing. Now your submarine just goes boom. Please, there was no way I was going to be like, yeah, we need help. No, stop, please. I understand. Yeah. So they they didn't they didn't take any help and all 118 sailors and officers aboard the Kursk would die. That's really sad actually. Yep. The Russian Admiralty at first thought that most of the crew died within minutes of the explosion, but that's not true. So they were able to recover bodies and find out yeah. through autopsies that they were they were alive. Oh no, some of the sailors had enough time that they were able to write notes about what it is they were experiencing. Captain Lieutenant Dmitry Kolonikov, who was one of the survivors of the first explosion, he survived in compartment nine at the very stern of the boat after the blast destroyed the forward spaces of the submarine. Recovery workers, after hauling up the submarine, found notes on his body. They showed 23 sailors out of 118 aboard had waited in the dark with him. Now, there's a lot of debate over how long the sailors might have survived. Truthfully, we don't really know. Some point out that many potassium superoxide chemical cartridges that were used to absorb carbon dioxide and chemically release the oxygen uh, afterwards were able to enable survival. These were found used when the craft was recovered, suggesting that some of them had survived for a significant amount of time. Question. How deep was it? Actually, for the seabed, that's a great question for this in here. Like the thing was designed to go down to 3,300 feet. Yeah, but if you're down at 3,300 feet, you can't just get back up because I'm assuming with a blast like that, there was pressure issues now. Yes, there were going to be severe pressure issues. So His, even if they were to get them, how are they going to get them all the way back up? In enough time, yeah. Also, what were they breathing? They were, it couldn't be that deep if they were breathing just like air. I mean, I, that's a great question. Because if you get down deep enough, you need to start breathing like helium because the nitrogen is going to make you Really sick. Yes. Yes. The and nitrogen and air. At that point, though, it's also going to depend upon the amount of time that they would be down there or how long it would take to get down there in the first place. The thing but, is, if you dive, I think it was like 250 feet or something like that. It takes like five hours to get back up, like to decompress fully. I'm pretty sure the stuff was already in the system to be able to do. Because, I mean, that, that's how the submarines were designed. So they would have had stuff that would enable them to do things in the first yeah, place. Yeah, but if the blast went through the boat, how much of the hull... How you know much I mean? would it have lasted? Exactly. Potentially it released all the other stuff that they would have breathed. 
So you'd oh. have to see the extent of the damage on the submarine and how sealed the compartments were in the first you place. Yeah. Plus also if you're down deep enough, like at certain depths, it gets really cold. That makes sense. Well, we know that they survived for a while. We do know this. We don't know how long because the last note is timed at 1500 hours and 15 minutes, like literally 3.15 p.m., which means that from the time when everything went down in the first place, that he and the others in the aft compartment had survived for at least four hours. Yeah, but I'm, you know, when they were saying it could be days there, I feel like depending on depth, it would not have been days. And Correct. also depth and damage to the actual submarine itself. Correct. And after 32 hours of the first explosion, no attempt was made to really try and signal the Russian submarine rescue vehicle from it when it attempted to mate with the aft escape trunk and like actually see what was in there and get them out. Western media would go and criticize the fact that it took 32 hours to actually respond as this was very slow, but... Generally speaking, it's not fair. Like, it's something that people were being overly critical as this was happening well, because the general published response times in 2000 was 72 hours. So if anything, they, they responded pretty quickly. I think they would get criticized for specifically not accepting help when it was offered. Oh, yes, offered absolutely. Because it might have been a lot faster. Oh, absolutely it would have. Because I also just covered a diving bell incident where a ship came up to help them with a functional crane and everything to like, recover the oh, bell. the one where the, they did the wrong tube? No, this was another one. This was the one where they cut the transponder cable, oh. the lift cable broke, and they tried to pull it up by the cable that, you know, sends water, air, everything down. Yes. Um, anyway, someone tried to help them and they were like, no, we can use our crane and they just made it worse. Uh. <laughs> Messy. People sometimes don't like to accept help when they fucked up. Yeah. No, they did. Yeah. The situation either way for these guys was not going to be good. The oxygen generator cartridges appear to have been the cause of death of the sailors from what they found, though, as a sailor appears to have accidentally brought a cartridge in contact with the seawater, which when this happened, it would have caused a chemical reaction and a flash fire inside. The official investigation into the disaster would show some men appeared to have survived the fire by then plunging underwater that would have been inside the submarine. Fire masks on the walls indicate that the water was at waist level in the lower area at this time. So for four hours, mind you, they are sitting in there waist deep in water that is freezing with a fire that is raging around them. However, the fire would then have rapidly used up the oxygen that was in there. Meaning that they would have asphyxiated, as asphyxiated, they, they, they would have choked to death. So it was definitely not days. Yeah, no, they, they, it is very unlikely okay. that they would have lasted for a very long time because they would end up asphyxiating to death very rapidly again as the fire would consume all the oxygen. And so while Kursk and its tragedy would play out all over this time period, when while it was being talked about everywhere in that vicinity, it wasn't being talked about in Russia. They couldn't reveal this at the time. This was a, ma remember who you said, oh my God, no, they can't accept help. This is a major embarrassing thing. They can't do this. That's the thing. But you can't hide it from your own people either. Yep. I mean, I guess you can, but you should not. Yep. So Putin, who was in charge at this time. Still, uh, back then? Putin How has long been has Putin in, been in charge? Putin was in charge since I think 1999 is when he was elected. And he was new to the position. He was new to the position at the time. It's not great. Yeah. <sighs> he had not been in charge for very long. I think it was 1999 or 2000. Like he had literally just been elected. Like either that year or the previous year, if I remember correctly, for which one it is. Although he was informed of the tragedy when it happened immediately, um, he didn't do anything. What was he supposed to do? Go well, down diving and no, grab him? No, normally when there's a disaster, normally when something happens, like, you know, if you're on holiday or something like that, you take, like, you stop it and you go. Like in the case, like, let's say that, you know, like if a president is on vacation or something like that, like they're, um, and then a terrorist attack happens. They, they got to cancel their vacation, they fly back cancel, and do come a back, state of make the an address. address exactly. Thing. Yeah. They will do that. He waited for five days while he was still on holiday at a presidential resort house in the subtropical Sochi region on the Black Sea before coming back and commenting publicly on the loss of pride of the Northern Fleet. A year later, he would say, this is kind of a stupid thing that he did at the time, but again, yeah, I guess he was kind of new to his job, quote, I probably should have returned to Moscow, but nothing would have changed. I had the same level of communication both in Sochi and in Moscow. But from a PR point of view, I probably could have demonstrated some special eagerness to return. Literally, if that wasn't just the most, 
The optics. The optics. Are terrible. I'm like, yeah. <sighs> I know I couldn't do anything, which I yeah, know, technically speaking, he's yeah, right. Like, he you wouldn't can't have changed actually anything. do anything. And he was getting informed, but it just like all of these men just died. And you're just like, I'm on vacation. Yeah. Just like with his little drink by the pool. Ah, oh, yes. Updates. That's terrible. So ends Kursk. And that's the last disaster that I have in here. I really only had the two because I figured going and talking about these in details rather than giving just little brief descriptions would be, I mean, it basically ate up the hour that we would have in here in the first place in order to be able to talk about this stuff. But you know that there are a lot more disasters to talk about. But if you all want to hear that, then you need to check out the mystery of everything. <laughs> this is t- yeah, this, I'm awful at segues, aren't I? You really are. But yeah, you guys should definitely check it out because the deep water disasters have been so disturbing to look at. Yeah. Anyway, well, my friends, thank you very much for watching and or listening, depending upon where it is that you are and what you're listening or watching on. And besides that, we will see you all next time. Goodbye, my friends. Bye.